Church history can encourage us and it can discourage us. We can read of these marvelous things happening and say, well, why doesn't it happen to me? Why? I'm trying to be faithful. I'm trying to preach as I should. But we need to go away viewing what happened to Spurgeon in the right way because it was the Lord's doing. It was his work. It was by his grace. And Spurgeon would have been the first to acknowledge that that we are not all called to be C.H. Spurgeon, we are called to be us. God has made us the way we are, with our own gifts, our own background, our own sense of calling. And if we can go away determined not to be C.H. Spurgeon, but to serve the God who C.H. Spurgeon served, then we will be strengthened, we will be equipped. God may use us in large ways or small ways, but all the glory, however that is, goes to God. I want to make two background observations to begin with, and uh, there should be some uh, statistics come up which are also on your sheet. Um, Just to give you a a sense of the magnitude of the ministry of Spurgeon. Spurgeon's ministry saw extraordinary blessing. You'll see the figures on on the sheet as well as on the screen. In 1854, the first year that he moved from Water Beach to New Park Street Chapel, 121 new members were added to the church. In 1856, 242 members were added to the church. In 1857, Spurgeon recorded a 1,000 people converted. He recognized it was a time of revival. He recognized this was extraordinary what was happening. But between 1854 and his death in 1892, an astonishing 14,000 692 new members were added to New Park Street and that became the Metropolitan Tabernacle. And when Spurgeon died in 1892, the membership of the church was 500, sorry, 5,311, just a little bit lower than its highest number. So what happened in Spurgeon's ministry was extraordinary. Partly the early years were in revival, but then that work was sustained. But Spurgeon would have said, it's all of God's grace. It's God's doing that this happened. And the other thing to say, and just a few more statistics, which are also on the sheet, is that Spurgeon's ministry took place in challenging times. So we should see a picture of London, a London street scene. In 1851, just before Spurgeon began his ministry in London, A census was taken of the religious adherents in the city, and they found that 35% of people in London regularly attended church. By today's standards, that's enormous. But even at the height of the Victorian era, 65% of people across Britain were not going to church. And it was a shock, a shock to observers, that this wasn't a Christian nation in terms of attendance. Spurgeon's ministry was in Southwark, um, and in Southwark, where New Park Street was, 68% of the population lived in real poverty. There were huge issues with overcrowding. There were problems with sanitation, like the street scene here. There were many slums, much criminality, much prostitution. And one of the major incidents that Spurgeon encountered, first of all, when he reached London in 1854, was the outbreak of cholera, a cholera epidemic that claimed 10,700 Londoners' lives. Alongside that, problems with the, uh, the physical state of the city, spiritually, there were real problems. One writer of inner city London in 1880s described it as a vast mass of moral corruption, of heartbreaking misery and absolute godlessness. And a vicar in South London, not far from where the Metropolitan Tabernacle was in the 1890s wrote this, the church has lost its hold over the great bulk of the people. If indeed it ever had a hold, thousands live lives of practical heathenism. The way to reach the poor of London with the gospel has not yet been discovered. Religion, in any real sense, does not enter into the lives of a great bulk of the people here. And so 
there are similarities to the situation in Britain we face today. So Spurgeon clearly did some things right. We honor God for his grace, but Spurgeon was clearly on the right lines. And the focus of this talk is Spurgeon as evangelist, fitting in with the theme of the conference. So we're going to concentrate on that. There are many books about Spurgeon taking different angles, and there are things that won't be said here, but the focus is on him as an evangelist, and clearly he was an effective evangelist. So some points to make. The first would be this. Spurgeon was convinced of the importance, the vital necessity of evangelism. And there should be a quote here from his book, Soul Winning, uh, which you can actually get on the bookshop as well. I've noticed it there. Spurgeon declared, soul winning is the chief business of the Christian minister. Indeed, it should be the main pursuit of every true believer. And we had a quote similar to that uh, from our main speaker as well. Evangelism was vital. And he drew a distinction between evangelism and what we would call sheep stealing, building up a congregation by means of taking church members from elsewhere. This is what he said about that. We count it utter meanness to build up our houses with the ruins of our neighbor's mansions. We infinitely prefer to quarry for ourselves. Christian leaders, he urged, should be committed to the growth of the kingdom of God, not of their clan, as he put it. He also differentiated evangelism from counting professions. And he wrote, I'm weary of this public bragging, this counting of unhatched chickens, this exhibition of doubtful spoils. And we need to ask ourselves, are we still convinced of the vital necessity of evangelism? F-I-E-C, evangelical. It's what it says on the door. Evangelical means a commitment to the gospel and its proclamation. Second thing, Spurgeon stressed the urgency of the task of evangelism. He lived in times when there was cholera, when life was short. He himself didn't make it to his 60th birthday. He was aware that as he preached, there would be some in the congregation that this may be the last time that they would hear the gospel. And so he wrote, and the quote should come up here, our great object of glorifying God is to be mainly achieved by the winning of souls. If we do not win souls, we shall mourn as the husbandman who sees no harvest. The ambassadors of peace should not cease to weep bitterly until sinners weep. For their sins. He believed that God should lay upon the heart of the gospel preacher a burden for the lost, a burden that led to weeping, but also that was like a fire within the bones. And so he said this as fire within the bones, that calling will influence until it blazes forth. Friends may check him, foes criticize him, Despisers sneer at him. The man is indomitable. He must preach if he has the call of heaven. And a warning, a warning he made to ministers and to his students. The souls of multitudes may perish through our neglect. This was an urgent task, but also a solemn responsibility. The third thing I would say is this, that his evangelistic burden was shaped by his own conversion. You know the story well, brought up in a Christian home. His grandfather was a pastor. His father was a lay pastor, deeply read in the scriptures and the Puritans. But Spurgeon, into his teenage years, was without that personal knowledge of a work of grace in his own heart and without assurance. Then one Sunday, as he was unable to go to his usual chapel because of a heavy snowfall, he turned into a nearby Methodist chapel, and there should be a picture of that. He heard a sermon he later described as one of the worst he'd ever heard. 
It may, in fact, have been the person leading the service, scraping some thoughts together in the hope that the preacher would make it through the regular snow, through the snowstorm. There was some, some debate about who exactly it was. But the text was Isaiah 45, 22. Look unto me and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. And the speaker, well, he could do not much more than simply repeat the text. Look, he said, look, look. And then he did something that's probably not recommended in most books on uh, expository preaching. Uh, he fixed his eye on a member in the congregation who was Spurgeon and said, young man, you look very miserable. And you will always be miserable, miserable in life, in death, if you do not obey my text. But if you obey now, this moment, you will be saved. And he lifted his hands and he shouted, young man, look to Jesus Christ. Look, look, look. You have nothing to do but to look and live. And that's just what Spurgeon needed to hear. He needed to look to Jesus for salvation. And he said, I could have leapt. I could have danced. He wanted to shout, I'm forgiven. I'm a monument of grace, a sinner saved by blood. And there should be a picture of the, the pew that he sat in. But isn't there hope there for a small church thinking that maybe a conversion will never come? And there's hope for the struggling preacher as well. Those poor, feeble, stumbling words, no much more than the scripture text itself. And yet God used that to bring this man of God to himself, who was used in so many ways. But that conversion experience gave a special dimension and urgency to his preaching. He was convinced when he preached that there might just be some struggling, miserable person like he had been sitting in the congregation. And it led to his conviction that in every sermon, there should always be something of the message of the gospel in case that was the case. He was convinced of the importance, of the urgency, and his own conversion showed him of the necessity of gospel preaching, however inadequate we are at that. But let's move on to the next thing, which is to say that his evangelism was underpinned by prayer. Mm -hmm. When he accepted the invitation to move from Water Beach to New Park Street, which later became the Metropolitan Tabernacle, in his letter of acceptance, he added this request. One thing is due, he said, namely that in private, as well as public, all must wrestle in prayer, that I may be sustained in the great work. And so that was the bargain. He preached, they prayed, and the two went together. The pastor and the congregation shouldered the great burden of reaching the lost in London. And he was convinced of the power of prayer. He said, one sigh of the soul has more power in it than half an hour's recitation of pretty, pious words. And the congregation were true to their commitment to him. And there should be a quote coming up now. And it's on the sheet. I can never forget how earnestly they prayed. Sometimes they seemed to plead as though they could really see the angel of the covenant present with them. More than once, we were all so awestruck at the solemnity of the meeting that we sat silent for some moments while the Lord's power appeared to overshadow us. Every person seemed like a crusader besieging the new Jerusalem. Each one appeared determined to storm the celestial city by the power of intercession and see the blessing come upon us. On a Monday evening at Metropolitan Tabernacle, something like 1,000 people gathered each week for the prayer meeting. And when someone once asked him the secret of his success, he said simply this, my people pray for me. His evangelism was underpinned by prayer. But it was also motivated by a pastoral heart. The next picture should be of the, uh, the new Park Street Chapel. Um, down towards Southwark, uh, this place, area where there was the cholera epidemic, uh, 
cost 10,000 lives in London. And Spurgeon devoted himself to visiting the sick and their families out of his pastoral heart. And as his preaching brought a large level of response, follow-up was needed, which quickly became beyond his own capacity. And so his faithful deacons and church officers took on this work, and then his brother was appointed as assistant minister. But let's not forget the pastoral heart that lay behind Spurgeon's evangelism. And one of the officers of the Metropolitan Tabernacle spoke of the capacity of Spurgeon to hold and rapt attention over 6,000 people on a Sunday morning and how great and grand that was. But then he said Spurgeon was even greater and grander when you found him sitting beside the bedside of a dying child in the orphanage that Spurgeon had started and brought into being. He was a man with a big heart, a big pastoral heart. The next thing uh, to say is that Spurgeon was prepared to use non-church buildings. And perhaps we can have the next picture, which is of Exeter Hall. New Park Street Chapel was very quickly filled to capacity, um, despite there only being a small congregation at the start. And so they decided that they would enlarge the building, and they hired this building here, the Exeter Hall, uh, on the Strand. It had 4,000 seats, and very quickly it was filled with people coming to hear Spurgeon. It wasn't a church building. It was a hall that was held for religious purposes and uh, meetings of societies. But um, even when they had completed the extension at New Park Street Chapel, it was too small. And so in the morning they met in New Park Street and in the evening they went back to Exeter Hall. But Spurgeon realized that by using a non-church building, people were being attracted to listen to the message, to hear the gospel, who other would, otherwise would not enter a church building. And so they laid plans to build a much larger church, which became the Metropolitan Tabernacle. And while they did that, they used this building here, which is the next picture. Note what it's called, Surrey Gardens Music Hall. Remember, this is the Victorian era. It's the sort of place Christians would not go or should not go to the music hall. And yet Spurgeon saw it just as a big building, no barriers that people would face going across it. And so they used the Surrey Gardens Music Hall for services. It held between 10 and 12,000 people and was regularly filled. Sometimes they held services out of doors. But Spurgeon recognized that going into a church looking building was a barrier to many unbelievers. And so here was an opportunity created by circumstance because the church buildings were too small to reach many more than would have been possible. And then at the time of the Indian mutiny, and I hope there's going to be a picture come up of this, there was a vast service held um, in the Crystal Palace. And the Crystal Palace had turnstiles like a football stadium. And uh, when they held that service at the time of the Indian mutiny, at which Spurgeon preached, 23,654 people, it's about what Crystal Palace probably get to a football game now, um, went in to that service, and Spurgeon preached the gospel. But the day before, he went in to try out the acoustics in this huge building, it had no amplification, and he called out as loud as he could a simple Bible text, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And in that vast building was a workman fixing the seats ready for the next day, who heard those words. Several days later, he came personally to meet Spurgeon and he explained that he had been awakened by those words and he'd been converted through that biblical text being proclaimed there. God used Spurgeon in extraordinary ways, we can see. But the breaking down of barriers for people outside the church by using 
non-church buildings was a notable part of his ministry. So too was his willingness to work with others who held the same essential truths. And if we can have the next picture, it's a picture of D.L. Moody. D.L. Moody, and uh, we, I'm not sure whether he's still here, but we have the interim pastor of Moody uh, Church in Chicago. Moody was just a shoe salesman, converted and remarkably used as an international evangelist. He made notable visits to Britain in the 1860s, the 1870s, the 1880s, and the 1890s. And in his uh, campaigns in the 1870s and 1880s, each time spoke to more than a million people. But Moody had no theological training. His theology was very simple, very homespun. His focus was preaching the gospel. He did that very simply in uh, sermons full of anecdotes and humor, pathos and sentiment. And after he preached, Ira D. Sankey sang sacred solos. So Moody wasn't a theologian at all. In some ways, his theology was quite mixed up. But he had read Spurgeon's sermons. In fact, he was reading them from almost as soon as they were being published in the 1850s. Moody came to London in 1867 as an unknown evangelist and sneaked in to hear Spurgeon preach. And Moody was struck by this man. He said he seemed to have access to God that could bring power from heaven. That was the secret of his success. In 1874, when Moody came back to Britain, much more well-known and having great success in London, Spurgeon sent an invitation to him to preach at the Metropolitan Tabernacle. Moody replied, I will do anything. I will even black your boots. But he would not preach in the Metropolitan Tabernacle. He said, if they will not turn to God under your preaching, then neither will they be persuaded, even if one should rise from the dead. Well, eventually, uh, Moody was persuaded to preach for Spurgeon. And uh, in the 1880s, Spurgeon also preached for Moody at the start of the London ministry. When Moody preached at the tabernacle, he said, For years I've thought more of you than any man preaching the gospel on the earth. And I tell you the truth, I shrink from standing in your place. Some criticized Spurgeon for supporting Moody. But Spurgeon leapt to his defense. We are happy to have our friends here, he said, because somehow they have a grip on the masses, the quotes on the sheet. And they preach the gospel. We do not have it distinct from many voices, but I know what Mr. Moody means when he speaks and what Mr. Sankey means when he sings. I've never seen men carry meaning more fully on their lips. The gospel. The gospel was the basis of their unity and their partnership. If we turn over the page, the next thing I think we want to say is that Spurgeon mobilized and empowered his church members. An enormous work was done. But it wasn't all owing to Spurgeon. One way he found of freeing up space for unbelievers to attend the Metropolitan Tabernacle in an evening was to tell his members, don't come to church. Instead, he instructed them to be busy in running mission halls, Sunday schools, ragged schools, outreach to children in some of the most needy parts of London. And so the seats they freed up as they went out, engaged in ministry, others were able to, um, to take up. In 1867, the Metropolitan Tabernacle membership included 250 working as evangelists, tract distributors, missionaries, Bible women, or with other outreach agencies. There was a tract society, a ladies' benevolent society, a maternal association. People took on ministry in lay preaching, visiting hospitals, visiting the homeless in lodging houses. Miss Lavinia Bartlett was one of the remarkable ladies who worked um, with Spurgeon. She ran a Bible class 
attended by 700 women. Many of them came into church membership through his ministry. One part of his uh, equipment of others was with the Cole Porters. I hope we have a picture of one of them. Uh, they were men employed to travel the country with a, a backpack on full of Bibles and books. They went door to door and in marketplaces selling Bibles, selling Christian books, distributing tracts. Over a hundred were employed in the Cole Porters Association. And Susanna, uh, Mrs. Spurgeon, took a key role in that, organizing, sending out packets of books to needy pastors. And there should be a picture of Susanna Spurgeon coming up next as well. There she is. Some years ago, um, I was told by a, a pastor um, who'd bought a book in a second-hand bookshop that uh, he'd opened it uh, and to his delight found that this had a letter in it from Mrs. Spurgeon to the pastor who was the donor uh, of this, uh, this book to help him in his ministry. So she wrote many letters of encouragement to pastors. But Spurgeon realized an important missiological principle that the people of the local area are key to winning that area to the gospel. Spurgeon preached, but he also trained, he equipped, he mobilized his church members. And a great deal of that success was owing to that work of training and equipping and mobilizing that went on. The next thing I would say is that Spurgeon connected evangelism and social concern. He was a man with a big heart pastorally and a man of great compassion. And he lived in a city where there were many needs. There was no social security system, no national health, no state assistance, no pensions. And, God, and Spurgeon believed that God had appointed Christian people to bring compassion and mercy to the world. And the quotes on the sheet there, act out deeds of mercy, persevere in labor, continue in service before God. If the poor be fed, it must be by these hands. And so out of that social concern, there was started a school and some almshouses, um, a school for 400 children, there were um, 27 Sunday schools with over 600 teachers and 8,000 pupils, um, almshouses for 17 elderly women. And then with the help of a wealthy widow, Mrs. Hilliard, Spurgeon was able to have the funds to build an orphanage, which should be the next picture. Rather than being a big institutional building, it was a series of small cottages linked together, each with accommodation for 14 boys and a matron to care for them. There was a gymnasium, a swimming pool, an infirmary, and 10 years later, a girls' orphanage was added. Spurgeon delighted to visit there with his pockets filled with sweets and pennies for the boys and girls. Some people call the, sp the orphanage the best sermon Spurgeon preached. But to him, social concern sat comfortably with the gospel. Just as Christ cared for the body and the soul, so should the Christian. And that opened many hearts and ears to the gospel. But another thing to say is this. Alongside building this huge congregation, Spurgeon was committed to church planting. He didn't jealously guard the numbers. And alongside that work, he was encouraged, involved in encouraging new causes, sending out groups of church members to start new congregations. He often preached at the opening of these churches or raised money for them. From the pastor's college, there should be a picture of that, he sent out students to, as he put it, blaze away where there were no churches and to start a cause. And one researcher found that in one way or another, either through sending preachers out, sending out church members, raising money for churches, encouraging churches to be started, he was involved in some way with the founding of 187 churches. It transformed 
the Baptist churches of the time. By 1892, 14% of the membership of all Baptist churches was in those churches Spurgeon had been in some way involved in encouraging or helping to start. He didn't hold tightly to that large congregation, but freely shared the blessings. But something to say now about the way he engaged in evangelistic preaching. Spurgeon believed that evangelistic preaching should engage the heart as well as the mind. He joked about preachers who had one long doctrinal leg and one short emotional leg. The result, he said, was a limping ministry. But he went on, it's a horrible thing for a man to be so doctrinal that he can speak coolly of the doom of the wicked. I hate to hear the terrors of the Lord proclaimed by men of hard visages, harsh tones, an unfeeling spirit. All the milk of human kindness is dried out of them. We are to seek our neighbor's conversion because we love him. And we're to speak to him in loving terms, God's loving gospel, because our heart desires his eternal good. And so that feeling was to be there on the part of the preacher, that love. But feeling was also to be evoked in the hearer as well. Spurgeon said this, To win a soul, it's necessary not just to instruct our hearer and make him know the truth, but to impress him so that he may feel it. Religion without emotion is religion without life. A sinner has a heart as well as a head. A sinner has emotions as well as thoughts. And we must appeal to both. A sinner will never be converted unless his emotions are stirred, the quotes on the sheet. Unless he feels sorrow for sin, and unless he has some measure of joy in the reception of the word, you cannot have much hope of him. This is quite different to the carefully polished and manufactured discourses of some preachers of his day. I wonder whether we preach the gospel with our hearts as well as our heads. Do your hearers know how you feel about the gospel and the Lord Jesus Christ? Can they see to you it really matters? And can they feel that sense from you? Evangelistic preaching should engage the heart as well as the mind. But another thing to say Gospel preaching was to be compelling and attractive. Compelling and attractive. He rejected a didactic ministry, just firing out propositions or biblical texts. He remembered when he started as a Sunday school teacher, and one of the young lads called out to him, Teacher, pitches a yarn. And that clearly influenced his approach to preaching. So he shied away from a series of propositional statements and argued for a narrative form following the example of Jesus, who used parables and illustrations and stories from everyday life. And so Jesus would say, the kingdom of heaven is like, and there would be a story or an illustration or a parable. And Spurgeon's sermons are full of story and illustration. And this was all delivered with a natural and an easy style. But behind that was a huge amount of preparation. You should have a picture of Spurgeon studying, which he did a great deal. He spent many hours each week reading. He was also blessed with something like a photographic memory, which helped. But he spent hours preparing, and then in the day immediately before preaching, he would focus on the text and spend time on that. So he didn't believe in the in immediate inspiration of the spirit of preaching, but he didn't also believe in artifice and affectation. The idea was to have the mind and the heart well prepared with a clear sense of what you were going to say, but trusting to God to lead the words that he would use. 
He said, I love to preach in such a mood, not as though I was about to preach at all, but the Holy Spirit would speak through me. The structure and style of the sermons was simple and clear and memorable. There was alliteration. There was an easy structure. Texts were appropriate to the occasion. He preached in the open air at Epsom Downs at the time of a race meeting. And his text was this, so run that you may obtain. Sense of humor was never far away in his preaching. Someone described it as the gleam of sunshine on the ripples of a river. He was not afraid of the common touch. There was no unusual voice or tone or manner in the pulpit. There was no pulpiteering or pulpitism. As one observer put it, there was a complete absence of everything from his tone or manner that might remind you of church or chapel. Another said he did not declaim like an actor, but conversed with you like in the street. He seemed to shake hands with all around and put everyone at their ease. Spurgeon was attempting a wholesale shift in the style of preaching back to that of John Bunyan. Indeed, back to the style of Christ himself, who preached on the hills of Galilee and the masses gladly heard him. What bishop or preacher in some gilded chapel would use an illustration involving a pawnbroker. But Spurgeon did, and he knew for many people the only way to get by through the week was to go to the pawn shop and pawn your possessions. Look here, he said, your soul is in pawn to the devil. Christ has paid the redemption money. You take faith as your ticket and get your soul back from the pawnbroker. But some of the strongest resistance to his preaching and his style came from other church leaders. Some were more interested in their reputation for erudition and learning than the eternal destiny of their hearers, it seemed. One writer described him in his sermons as redolent of bad taste, vulgar, theatrical. The Saturday Review called him a coarse, stupid, irrational bigot. But E. Paxton Hood, who was another uh, one who went to hear, said this. He preaches not to metaphysicians or logicians, not to poets or savants, but to, not to masters of erudition or masters of rhetoric. He simply preaches to men. And he was called the people's preacher or the poor man's cardinal because men and women, ordinary men and women, could understand him. It said that scholarly preachers attracted the respectable, but the crowd went to hear Spurgeon. And they listened to him often for an hour and gladly did so. And many responded. Another thing to say as we draw to a close, Spurgeon's evangelistic preaching had serious theological content. William Robertson Nicoll, a 19th century writer and preacher, was of the opinion that uh, after reading Spurgeon's sermons, that an important part of his success as an evangelist was his theology. And Spurgeon was unashamedly a Calvinist. If you read the opening sermons preached at the start of the Metropolitan Tabernacle, then you will see again and again messages about the doctrines of grace. Spurgeon preached the electing love of God, Christ's particular redemption of his people, and the perseverance of God's saints to glory. He combined Calvinism with an urgency, an experiential emphasis, a devotional warmth. He did it in the company of men like George Whitfield and Jonathan Edwards. He maintained the twin emphasis of trust in the absolute sovereignty of God for salvation, but the serious responsibility of preachers to preach the gospel and hearers to believe the gospel when they heard it. He was convinced that evangelism and doctrine were connected. Do not believe, said Spurgeon of evangelistic services, that you are to leave doctrine out of the gospel, for you ought to proclaim the doctrines of grace rather more than less. Teach gospel doctrines clearly 
affectionately, simply, and plainly. And he went on on the quotes on the sheet. We may shout, believe, believe, believe. But what are they to believe? Each exhortation requires a corresponding instruction, or it will mean nothing. Escape. But from what? It requires for its answer the doctrine of the punishment of sin. Fly. But whither? Then you must preach Christ and his wounds, yea, and the clear doctrine of atonement by, by sacrifice. Repent. Of what? Here you must answer such questions as what is sin? What is the evil of sin? What are the consequences of sin? Evangelistic preaching should have serious theological content. He was utterly convinced the Bible was the word of God. Without this, he said, we are at sea without a compass. And there should be a picture of Spurgeon um, coming up. An older Spurgeon now, aged by a controversy in the 1880s, the so-called downgrade controversy, when he took a stand against the decline in orthodoxy, the decline in uh, evangelical orthodoxy amongst Baptists and other denominations. He challenged that creeping of theological liberalism that was coming in, and he stood against it. He made the strong statement, fellowship with known and vital error is participation in sin. It won him few friends, but he was right. By the early 20th century, theological liberalism was widespread and many evangelicals were former evangelicals. He was clear, if the evangel is unclear or diluted or wrong, there would be little fruit from evangelism. So he sought to stand firmly on the gospel. Spurgeon also, in his preaching, sought to set Christ before his hearers. He believed that in any preaching of the gospel, it was the person and work of Christ that should be central. And there should be a quote comes up here, which is on the sheet. He said, if a man can preach one sermon without mentioning Christ's name in it, it ought to be his last sermon. He declared at the opening of the Metropolitan Tabernacle that his creed was focused on Jesus Christ. The sum and substance of the gospel, he said, who is himself all theology, the incarnation of every precious truth, the glorious personal embodiment of the way, the truth, and the life. And to his students, he said this, the quote we have here, preach Christ always and evermore. He is the whole gospel. His favorite text was, of course, 1 Timothy 1, 15. We have at least six sermons on it. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all accept acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of which I am the chief. Some asked whether on a special service, an evangelistic service, there should be a different type of message. And his answer was this. The best attraction is the gospel in all its purity. The weapon with which the Lord conquers men is the truth as it is in Jesus. The gospel will be found equal to every emergency. An arrow which can peer the hardest heart. A balm which will heal the deadliest wound. Preach it and preach nothing else. Spurgeon sought through preaching Christ and his cross to bring simple faith in Jesus. And the last thing to note about Spurgeon and his ministry was that it was his ambition to bring glory to God. And that's the emphasis I want you to take away from this. A great man used in wonderful ways, but our great God is behind all this and his grace. His greatest topic, his greatest theme was the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And one of his most famous sermons was called The Eternal Name, preached in 1855. His wife described him preaching it. He seemed to be pouring out his very soul and life in homage and adoration before his gracious king. 
I really thought he would have died there in the face of all the people. At the end of the sermon, he made a mighty effort to recover his voice, but could only in broken tones utter the final peroration. Let my name perish, but let Christ's name last forever. Jesus, 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 crown him Lord of all. You will not hear me say anything else. Jesus, 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 crown him Lord of all. Let's pray, shall we, as we close. Loving God, our Father in heaven, we give you thanks for the life and ministry of C.H. Spurgeon. We thank you for his faithfulness, his willing to, willingness to spend and be spent for the sake of the gospel. Thank you for the way you used him. And as we reflect on his life, help us to capture some of his spirit, some of his thinking, to learn lessons from him that will be relevant and helpful for today. But above all, Lord God, through Spurgeon, take us to yourself, to your greatness, to your majesty, to the wonders of your grace and the glories of your gospel. And help us to go away with a renewed conviction of the urgency of the task set before us, of the importance of this message. And the determination to cry to you, Lord, make us faithful. And in your mercy, grant us fruit. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.